Good evening, everybody. Uh, just a couple of minutes late here this evening. Um, I do apologize. First, uh, I normally try to get these taped uh, before Wednesday evening, but this is truly live. Uh, just running in the door and uh, trying to make sure that we have an opportunity to spend some time together. Um, our normal um, procedure would take us to our healing and restoration list. I'm not aware of any of our members that are sick or are in the hospital. I have gotten word of uh, some family members of our members that uh, are, have taken ill. And, but I'm sure there's something for us to be praying about. So I do want to read um, from Psalm 59, just a couple of verses. Go in prayer. And then I just want to uh, talk to us this evening. Uh, I want to thank all of those who uh, went by to see Sister Green's uh, memorial service and um, signed the book and uh, were in support of that family. It was good to see a couple of our members that were in attendance as well. Um, very good homegoing service for Sister Green. So continue to be in prayer for her family as well. Psalm 59, uh, beginning with verse 1. Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity, and save me from bloody men. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen be not merciful to any wicked transgressors heavenly father we come this evening recognizing that you are god and you're god all by yourself and lord we just want to take this opportunity to humble ourselves before you thank you for allowing us to come before your throne to lift up our cares and our concerns. And Lord, we come praying for our members who are sick, even those we don't know their names or where they might be right now. But Lord, you know even when we don't know. Lord, we're praying for those who are hungry, praying for those who are isolated and lonely, praying for all of the emotions that are going on even in our city, uh, in our land and in our country. Lord, we're praying for bereaved families. We're praying for those who are behind prison walls. Lord, we're praying that you would come see about us as you always do. Continue to guide us. Continue to protect us. Continue to uh, lift up, bow down heads, and give us your peace. Father, we come in the mighty name of Jesus even again this evening. And all other people see it. Amen. Amen. The events of this past week have um, really uh, drawn focus to the things that we've been talking about. We've been talking about those who are called, those who are chosen, those who are committed, We're talking about following Christ. And in doing that, uh, we've been talking about the local New Testament church, and the local church ought to be doing some things. And I said I would come back to you here this evening to begin to talk about those four functions of the local test new testament church but just this week i feel like i need to speak to some things that are going on uh, because it is urgent and uh, the things that the church ought to be doing those functions that the church ought to be uh, carrying on uh, lend extremely well to what i want to say this evening so we'll come back and pick up those functions but I do need to speak to what's going on in the immediacy in, of what's going on in our country. As I said, um, the events of this week have pricked the conscience of our nation. Um, it has laid open and bared some wounds that we knew existed. Um, it has driven us to some deep places, some deep dark places that we have not been for some time. And 
we've recently witnessed how the total depravity of man plays out even in our country and it's it's interesting because um this is a nation this is a country that possesses such incredible technology the same week we are being depraved our technology allows us to place people into a habitation that circles the earth to live for 60 80 a hundred days before they come back to the to the earth this is a country with abundant wealth this is a country with an extremely high standard of living and it's a nation that's filled with so much possibility and potential and yet we arrive at this pivotal point in history and i do mean that this is a pivotal point this is a geopolitical shift that's taking place not just in our nation but in the entire world very interestingly the pandemic came along within our country it had already been elsewhere in the world but it comes into our country and not only did it close businesses but it took away all the other distractions that normally allow us to disengage with what's going on negatively in our society. No baseball, no uh, track and field, no basketball, uh, inability to go to the shopping mall. Uh, all of the distractions of our lives were taken away when the pandemic came and pretty much we were glued to the tube, if you will. Quarantined in our homes, isolated, watching the television, and we saw what happened. And in this pivotal moment, we've now run into what, what I would call a national moral crisis. And people are trying to understand how they ought to react to the crisis. And however one group reacts, somebody else sees it as a negative. But scripture speaks to this. Scripture speaks to this. If you have your pens, write down Psalm uh, 11, I believe it is. Let me take a quick look. Psalm 11, verse 1, 2, and 3. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in the heart. And I want you to hear verse number three very succinctly. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It appears the very foundations in the fabric of our democracy are being destroyed. But even more than that, it appears that the foundations of our Christianity are being destroyed as well. The text says, what can the righteous do? And it's interesting because this week I've had uh, more than just several of my young folks uh, call me and text me and go, okay, pastor, this went down. What's the plan? What's the plan? What will the righteous do? in this time of a national moral crisis and and our moral fabric is built upon 
our actions and our reactions. So my question then becomes, will we continue in this moral failure? Will we continue to be numb to the hurt and the pain and the brutality that's inflicted upon the members of this society, perpetrated by the establishment and inflicted upon members of the society? Will we continue to do that? Will we continue to allow the weakening of our families, even our traditional family structure? Will we continue to hold poor people, helpless people in contempt? When there is a crisis, there must be a solution and, and the first scripture that comes to mind is over in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Paul says, he warns us, he says, I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's what we ought to be doing. But verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. Are we being conformed to the world? We would continue to allow these things to go on because the interesting piece about all of the things that have even happened this week and all of the stuff that's happened before that's led up to this, that's made this such a momentous occasion, it's not new. We knew it was going on. We knew how it operated. Uh, there was the civil rights movement in the 60s. There was all kinds of things that happened before. So this is not something that we were not aware of, did not know about, but will we continue to conform to this world. Verse chapter 12, verse 2 continues and goes on to say, but be ye transformed. So if we're going to do something in this moral crisis, we've got to do something different than to conform to what's been going on all along. And we've got to be transformed. If we're going to be transformed, we need to stay right there in verse number two, transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've got to think differently. We've got to act differently out of our thoughts. But to transform our mind means that we've got to actually think about these things. We just can't simply react. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our transformation ought to begin in the word of God. Has to begin in the foundation that God laid. If the foundation and the fabric of all of the democracies and all of these things that are going on around the world are failing, God is bigger than all of the things that are going on in the world. And our transformation has to begin with the renewing of our mind, which means we ought to be getting in touch with our vertical relationship with God. And my vertical relationship with God assists me when it comes time to deal with the emotional struggles that I'm going through in a moral crisis. You know it's a moral crisis when everybody's trying to decide what it is that we ought to do. If it was an easy fix, if it was an easy uh, resolution, it would have already been done. This, this country spent more than 240 something years with people in slavery in over 400 years of us being denied. And so we have to present a different message than what's been presented before. In fact, maybe we just need to go back to the Declaration of Independence with unalienable rights. That's our founding document. And yet we did not have those freedoms and liberties at the founding. Now it's time to transform the ship and allow us those freedoms. 
But in all of the marches, in all of the speeches, in all of us uh, connecting in different manners, it doesn't matter if we have not transformed our minds. I understand that people are upset. I understand that people are angry. I understand uh, the rioting, the looting. I understand uh, people buying guns. That just leads to and lends and continues to show the depravity of man. Without God, man will perish. And I think it some, says somewhere in scripture, without a vision, the people perish. So here's, here's how our renewal begins. Here's how our transformation begins. First and foremost, we've got to take a look at ourselves in the local church. We have to give ourselves a internal retrospective or introspective appraisal. Quit looking at them. Look at me. Look at me. Have I conformed to this world or have I been a transformative nature? Is our local church transformative? Are we making a difference? Are we teaching God's word? Are we evangelizing the lost? Are we edifying and helping those who cannot help themselves? Are we doing those things, that the, the functions of a local church? Are we even committed to a church? We say we're called, we say we're chosen, but are we even committed? And it's amazing how we define commitment nowadays. We figure if we go once a month, we're committed used to be you had to go three times a week to be committed. Went Sunday morning, Sunday evening, VBS, Wednesday Bible study, but we've relaxed the standard and we've conformed to what the world wants to do. Children don't have to come to church anymore because they have other activities. They play baseball and soccer on Sunday. They have play rehearsals and, and band things and, and they're going places and see, we've gotten away from the church. And we begin to conform to what's going on in the world. Now we've got to transform in this moment of crisis. We've got to pivot. This is a pivotal moment. And so we need to take a look at what our church is doing. Have we positioned ourselves to give other people hope? Does anybody get the feeling or the sense that there is a better life or a better way or a better day ahead when they're in the presence of Christians in your building? And so we've got to, trans that's our plan. That's our plan. Here, in fact, here's the plan. Here's the plan. Fellowship. I, I, I can't speak for everybody else, but fellowship. Let's go to Mark chapter 8. Mark 8. Go to verse 34. Mark 8, 34. And when he had called, the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We're going to follow Jesus. That's going to be transformative. Because the teachings of Jesus have gotten muddied. We're going to clear those up. We're going to use the teachings of Jesus. We're going to follow Jesus. But the first thing it says is you've got to deny yourself. Know that this is bigger than you. This is a moment in history that is making a shift in the world today. 
it's not just national, it's international. It's come to a head. And now we've got to change. And now we've got to shift. We've got to organize. We've got to plan. We've got to see what the process is. We've got to do all of those things and follow that down where it leads politically. But in our, we must supersede that with our spiritual lives and we have to be transformed in our spiritual lives and our spiritual lives. We're going to deny ourselves and follow the doctrine and the teachings of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're going to follow Jesus, the first thing you have to do is deny yourself. Secondly, it says, take up your cross. So many of us want to pick up a piece of jewelry. We want to do something that has materialistic value. No, he says, take up your cross, take up your cause. And if you notice, when Jesus carried his cross, he was scourged, he was beaten, he was spat on. It might not be easy. But we've been living lives of consumer Christians for the last 50 years. We think that God's just going to bless us every day just because we're breathing. We don't have to do anything for it. If we're just laying around, God's just going to bless us. He's, in fact, while you're laying in the bed, he's going to bring you some new silk sheets and some new uh, down pillows just because you're in the bed. No, take up your cross and follow him. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. And here's what I need you to know out of that. It may not be easy. And it may not be quick either. This is going to be a marathon. I know corporations are all of a sudden donating money to racial diversity. I know uh, politicians are making speeches. I know uh, those who are famous and are influencers are starting to make statements. That's all politically expedient right now. It looks good, but this is going to be a long, hard journey. And it's going to take you bearing your cross and going into a community that you might not want to go into and spreading the word of God. I said on Sunday, the only way we can defeat this is through love. And so now you've got to take your interpersonal relationships, the folks that you know, the folks that you have uh, influence with, those who you come in contact with, and now you've got an opportunity to evangelize in that setting. You've got to teach them because they don't already know. And if they've already known, they've denied it. And you've got to prick their conscience. Bring it back to the forefront. Because the only way we can get through this moral failure is to have a moral transformation, renewal, revival. And it's got to begin at the church. That's where the foundation of everything begins. This, this country was founded on religious ideals. And so we've got to take our religious ideals in our families, in our personal relationships, and begin to export those to a wider community. And when we begin to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, those one-on-two -on conversations, and we begin to transform individuals that's when the nation will transform. I'm not saying uh, don't do all of the other things that uh, others are talking about doing. Register, vote. Register, vote. You can't vote without registering, so you got to register so you can vote. And I need for you to vote. But I need for you to be voting biblically. Vote your conscience. Vote what you know is right. And one of the things about conscience is it's actually tied back to God. We were created in the image of God. And so we know and we have an innate knowledge of God. And so oftentimes we know something is wrong, even if we haven't seen it written down somewhere that it's wrong. So we've got to evangelize, we've got to edify, and we've got to right the wrongs. So that when we go back to Psalm 11, Verse 3, 
what will the righteous do if the foundations be destroyed? What can the righteous do? Verse 4 says the Lord is in his holy temple and the Lord's throne is in heaven. We've got to keep our eyes, our minds, and our entire bodies stayed on Jesus. That's what the old folk used to say. Gonna keep my I woke up this morning. Somebody knows that. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. God bless you this evening. We'll get back into our functions of the church starting on next Wednesday night. But this lends right into that. We've got to make that shift in our new local, in our local New Testament church. Can I get an amen as we sign off? Somebody say amen. God bless you.